Hi, this is Player Base. I'm GR, and this video is especially for uh, teenagers and young children who may be wanting to play D&D, but their parents might have some concerns. So this is specifically for teenagers and children, and especially for their parents, to sort of explain what D&D is, or what role-playing games are, and what your understandable misgivings might be, although they aren't as pervasive as they used to be, and to address them. So, if you're a kid, or you're a teenager, and your parents are saying, you know, that's a waste of time, or that's really dangerous, show them this video, I hope it helps. Two things. The two principal misgivings that parents have for Dungeons and Dragons specifically, and role-playing games in general, are one, directed towards their advancement in life, and two, directed towards their spiritual health. So I'm going to focus on the advancement on life, and then we'll go to the spiritual health, and then we'll go to generally what role-playing games do for children and grown-ups. But we'll start with these two. Some people see the amount of time and effort and focus and energy and money that kids and grown-ups pour into role-playing games and think that is a tremendous and dangerous time sink that is only taking away from their studies and their athletics and the general development of their person. And that's a reasonable, understandable concern to have. So let me address it. Role-playing games are the foundation of modern society. Let me explain. There isn't an aspect of modern computing, uh, social interaction, which is almost all of it based on user interface through computers now, that isn't fundamentally in some way, if not in all ways, directly derived from Dungeons and Dragons and role-playing games. The game came out in the mid-1970s, and most people who had a foundational effect on the development of modern society, which is to say the people who invented computers and modern computing and the internet, have a deep background in Dungeons and Dragons. And how that shows up is the way that we interface with the world through computers is based on the interfaces in role-playing games. So if your children have an understanding of how those fundamental symbologies and syntaxes work, they have a much better literacy for navigating the world. And I don't just mean how to fix your iPhone. I mean how to engage in the interfaces on like a Reuters or a Bloomberg interface, you know, for day trading or stock options and things like that. How to read charts on a computer, how to program, how to design and also to analyze complex social interactions and the raw data from complex social interactions. And in case you aren't already familiar, almost all social media, in fact, most large computer and internet software companies actually make the bulk of their money on data collection and analysis. That's why Instagram and Facebook are free, as well as YouTube. So if your kid is playing role-playing games in Dungeons and Dragons, or they want to, that fact alone should give you some pause to consider that it's going to be helpful. In addition to that, the general lateral skills, which I'll get to at the end of the video, that they develop are incredibly important. But on top of that, the social organization of engaging in play, which is itself valuable, which I will get to, allows them a social mobility which outside of joining clubs or fraternities or being excellent at, at athletics, they will not have the opportunity to engage in once they get out of college and high school. What do I mean by that? Well, most of our upward mobility in the world comes from the connections and social interactions that we develop anew constantly and the ones that we foster. Outside of the social milieu of an academic background, there aren't many opportunities for that outside of your work and already established social life. You know, your family, whatever church or spiritual tradition you go to, your general routine. 
except for hobbies. Now, the thing about Dungeons and Dragons is that it's a hobby that crosses all echelons of society and does not require a tremendous amount of skill to be valuable in. What I mean by that is you don't have to be a very good football player in order to be a good enough dungeon master, right? If you want to be a professional, if you want to be a linebacker, for instance, you have to be the best of the best to make any money at it. But that's not true with Dungeons and Dragons. On top of that, if you want to play, say, an intramural sports and get to know people, usually even within the context of, you know, grown-ups playing uh, a hobbyist touch football after work, the teams are broken down into who they already know. So it's already relatively calcified in their class mobility. But with Dungeons and Dragons, that's not true. And if you work in an environment or a school or a business where there's lots of people who want to play or just in your general social environment of the suburb or the city that you live in, you can make social connections, which can, of course, lead to social mobility and better opportunities for their life and their advancement outside of the general calcified structures. And that is very, very helpful. On top of that, it's very good for developing all of the skills that are necessary for success, which I will get to at the end of the video. Now, this isn't as much of an issue as it was in the 80s, but I imagine there might still be some parents who have some misgivings about letting their kid play uh, with a game where there's magic and, you know, demons and things like that, and, you know, spells and other deities. So let me assure you of some basic facts. The game is set in a pseudo, but not really, Renaissance, early modern period, like 15th, 17th century Europe. Clerics and priests are an essential aspect of that. The environment, in terms of the structure that they're playing in, is thoroughly make-believe. It's not real. Um, and in fact, you know, the actual magic user, the wizards of the game, is one of the most tedious and boring characters to play because they have a whole bunch of lists of numbers. It's basically doing math tediously. There's no, they don't actually do anything. There's nothing esoteric about it. And on top of that, if it's a concern for you, because it is uh, like an end of Renaissance, early modern period, Western European game, sort of, you could have some very basic uh, strictures for them, such as, well, they have to play a cleric. So if you're like a Methodist or a Lutheran, Presbyterian, you could have your kid be a Presbyterian minister. Hell, if, if you're a Mormon, you can have the kid go on missionary work. That's something that you can do, and you can advance your character in the game doing that. I had someone do that once. They really enjoyed it. The social interactions in the game, even the ones that are engaged in like pseudo-spiritual, mystical inter interactions or personages, are not really equivalent to the kind of moral and spiritual development that they would be receiving in like a church or a temple environment. They're not even remotely the same thing. And it's not a threat to that either. In fact, many of the best dungeon masters are extremely orthodox in their religious practices. Now, I myself am from New York, and so I know a lot of orthodox Jewish dungeon masters. And let me tell you, rabbis make excellent dungeon masters as do priests and occasionally deacons. Why is that? Well, because they have to hold a whole bunch of rules in their head which are interacting with each other ad hoc. In fact, the ability to understand the seemingly abstract and purposeless minutia of details in the rule sets in a role-playing game facilitates developing that type of model in their head which is incredibly useful if you are going to study or need to adhere to a specific and intricate theology. Like, say for instance, if you have a dietary restriction or a prayer restriction in your religious practice, or if you're going to seminary, that kind of thing. And so, f especially for kids who are not particularly good at remembering you know, which psalm it is that says you're supposed to fast on that particular period, or like which part of the gospel it mentions 
that you're supposed to comb your hair when you're fasting. You know, or which part of the Torah or the Quran mentions what you can and cannot eat. Getting good at the rules of a role-playing game facilitates that. So if you have any questions, if, if your kid has showed you this, and you want them to be answered, please mention it in the comments, and I'll be happy to address them. Now, going back to everybody in general, let me go over what the skills are that you develop as a player in a role-playing game that are so especially useful for children and for teenagers. So here are the things that you develop playing role-playing games. You develop the ability to read and understand and interact with nonverbal communication, particularly with people's likes and dislikes. You learn how to engage in a group where you are temporarily but not always the center of attention. You learn how to both verbally and nonverbally attend to other players and people's needs in a social group and to foster their likes and minimize their dislikes. You learn how to negotiate parameters for things that you want and you don't want. You learn how to schedule. Your math and your reading comprehension get better. This is particularly important because in actual fact, most of the basic books in, say, Dungeons and Dragons, which is the simpler, the simplest of all role-playing games in terms of the reading level, they're at like a first or a second year college reading level. Most people, most people in positions of authority and executive leadership in companies read at best at a 10th grade reading level. So if you have a 10-year-old who wants to play Dungeons and Dragons, they are going to have to, before they even hit puberty, develop more or less a college-age reading level comprehension. And the math, oh my geez, the math. Like, it's not complicated, it's not super hard, but it is involved and it's not always immediately clear. So they're going to have to develop reading comprehension, but also reading comprehension as it applies to uh, mathematical ability. They're going to have to develop the ability to do math on the fly. They're going to have to develop the ability to have an innate sense of how much things are, how, how much things are worth, how to negotiate numerical values and social circumstances, which is very important if you're going into business, how to understand what things are necessary to say and what things aren't necessary to say and what things are necessary to not say in order for things not only to go smoothly but for everyone to feel fulfilled. Those are just a few of the things that you develop as well as patience, scheduling, uh, <laughs> the ability to fill out forms quickly and easily, the ability to teach other people how to understand information that isn't exactly clear, the ability to both read and write technical manuals, the ability to explain to other people completely foreign ideas and concepts in ways that are immediately intelligible. All of these skills are very useful in every aspect of life, but particularly if you want your child to be successful in their ability to provide for themselves in a business or economic context and an, and an academic one. <laughs> so I, I do hope that that has helped. And if you have any questions, please feel free to either message me privately or mention it in the comments and I'll be happy to address them either in the comments or in another video or through private messages. For now, I think that's everything. Thank you very much. I'm GR, this is Player Base, and this is more or less what we do here. I hope this was helpful. Have a good day.